So those of you who have been following my channel will probably remember I had a debate with another YouTuber who goes by a skeptical human. For those of you who aren't familiar, long story short, during one of the debates Anton decides to go into healthcare, which is a completely different topic from what we initially planned to discuss. This left me caught off guard with no opportunity to prepare. As a result of this, Anton was basically able to gish gallop and browbeat me, and I couldn't really muster much of a defense. Then when I try to explain to him, hey look, this is subject matter I'm not entirely familiar with, he proceeds to act like a condescending prick. Now, I was going to let this go and move on, but then I've come to find out that he's actually taking clips from the debate out of context and uploading them basically to make me look stupid. Needless to say, this is a massively dishonest douche move on his part, and it really pisses me off. So, I've basically decided to declare war on this guy's healthcare videos. I'm going to go through every single healthcare video this guy has made and basically scorched earth style destroy every bit of it. Starting with this one right here. In this video, Anton is going to address two common criticisms made against government-run healthcare, rationing and wait times. An argument that you'll invariably hear made against publicly financed healthcare is that such systems lead to the twin problems of intolerably long wait times and an unacceptable rationing of care. I figured this would be a good place to start since these are the two most common criticisms made against government-run healthcare. And I want to briefly explain why it is exactly that rationing and wait times are such a big problem in places that implement government-run healthcare. We'll touch on this in more detail later in the video, but for now what you need to understand is this. You see, there's an inherent underlying problem that plagues any sort of socialized service, and this problem is fundamentally inherent to the nature of any sort of socialized service. There really isn't any sort of way of getting around it, and that is the economic calculation problem. You see, when you socialize a service, that is, when you fund it involuntarily through coercion as opposed to voluntarily through the marketplace, you basically make it impossible to determine what the optimal quantity of resources is to devote to providing a particular service. These lack of market indicators basically mean that there's no way for the people running these government-run healthcare systems to determine what the right quantity of resources is to invest into these systems. This means that shortages are pretty much inevitable. And this phenomenon isn't unique to healthcare. This basically happens anytime you try to socialize something. The Soviet Union and Venezuela both tried nationalizing food. What was the result? People starving in massive bread lines. So that blindness to market feedback is going to be the Achilles heel of any sort of socialized service. And that's something you're going to want to keep in mind as we move forward in the video. So those of you who are familiar with my content will know that I tend to follow a bit of a pattern. What I usually do whenever I make these response videos is I take the video I'm responding to kind of whole cloth and then chop it up. Basically I take the whole video and insert an audio clip whenever I have an opinion on a point that was made in the video. Well the thing about Anton's videos is that they tend to be rather long. There are also a lot of these long segments where he goes into detail discussing a lot of data and statistics and this can get rather dry. So I figured that my usual strategy of responding to the entire video piece by piece wouldn't really be ideal for these videos. So in this video, I'm going to try a bit of a different formula from what I usually do. Instead of responding to the entire video, I'm going to try and condense things down as much as I can, and try to target my criticism towards specific key points made in the video. I figured this way of doing it would make for a lot more of a productive and interesting video. That being said, I've included a table of contents down in the description, with links to different segments throughout the video. Feel free to jump around to specific subjects that you find interesting. That being said, let's get on with the video. So Anton begins his video by classifying the healthcare systems of different countries into different categories. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to classify a nation's healthcare system into one of three categories in this video. Public, private, or mixed. There's obviously a lot more nuance to each country's system, but if you're looking for a dissertation on their complex differences, you're not going to find it here. So notice how he never bothers to explain what these different categories mean, nor does he ever explain the rationale that he uses to determine how to categorize different healthcare systems. This creates major problems for his arguments because it leaves a lot of ambiguity on the table. The whole point of this video is to compare the performance of different types of healthcare systems, but how are we supposed to make that 
comparison if we don't even know what these categories mean. Presumably, a public health care system means it's run by the government, a private health care system is run by the private sector, and a mixed system has elements of both private and public control. But these definitions are too vague to really mean anything useful. I mean, pretty much every country in the world has some extent to which their health care system is run by the government and some extent to which it's run by the private sector. So you could really classify every country in the world as a mixed system. Even countries like the UK with full-on nationalized health care have some degree of private I also noticed that he categorizes the U.S. as a private system. Now, it may be true that the United States has a greater degree of privatization in our healthcare system than in other countries, but I'd hardly call it a private system. The U.S. actually has very heavy government involvement in healthcare. The U.S. government spends mind-bogglingly massive amounts of money on government healthcare programs. We have Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA on the federal level alone. When you start to add up all the government healthcare expenditures on the state level as well, well, the United States easily spends more government money on health care than even a lot of single-payer countries. And that's not even to mention all the restrictions and regulations the government puts on the health care market. Everything from hospitals to insurance companies to drug manufacturers all have to comply with pages and pages of government regulations that significantly raises the cost of doing business. The U.S. health care system is far from a free market. It's simply not accurate to use the American health care system as an example to argue against free market health care. Shane Kill Killian makes this point clear in his video, How to Argue for Universal Healthcare. Stop comparing universal healthcare to the American system. I don't know how often this needs to be said. I don't know how long it'll take to sink in with you people. But we aren't in favor of the U.S. healthcare system. It's a statist, corporatist system, and we don't like it any better than your statist solution. We weren't even in favor of it before Obamacare was passed. The current U.S. healthcare system is the result of over half a century of government meddling, and Obamacare only made it worse. Continuing in this failed direction of greater government control, fewer patient choices, and more insurance and special interest cronyism. We fully acknowledge the problems you point out with the U.S. healthcare system. We agree and have provided evidence that these problems would be minimized or eliminated entirely with a free market healthcare system, with none of the problems that UHC countries experience. So you do not get to argue for your crappy status healthcare system by comparing it to another crappy status healthcare system. Really, all this does is tell us that you're nothing but a cultist. This is cult mentality, the we and the not we. Universal healthcare is the we, and so you get to be against anything that doesn't conform with your holy writ, no thinking required. And libertarian free market reforms get lumped in with the corporatist and cronyist monstrosities that we despise a lot more than you do, because much of this same corporatism exists with UHC too. The U.S. healthcare system is much closer to what you favor than to what we favor, and has been for decades. So right off the bat, we know that Anton completely fails to explain how he's categorizing these different healthcare systems. Now, why exactly is it that I'm choosing to bring this issue up at the beginning of the video? Well, like I said before, the whole point of Anton's video here is to compare the performance of different healthcare systems. So a lot of the arguments he makes in this video are predicated upon the distinction between different healthcare systems. If all of the arguments he's going to make in this video are resting upon this distinction, which is dicey at best, then that's going to badly bite him in the ass later in the video. Here I'm going to take a very close look at the subject, examining the data from a variety of countries in several key areas of healthcare. I'm not going to be hiding from any data or inconvenient facts to make my position look better. Instead, I'm going to do my best to provide a very thorough and honest examination of how the different healthcare systems on offer compare to one another in terms of wait times and rationing. Alright, so we have one very big red flag right from the onset, and that is he's basically getting all of his data about wait times from one source, as opposed to aggregating data from a variety of different sources in an attempt to get a more 
more holistic picture, which is what you would want to do if you're approaching this intellectually honestly. Now this wouldn't necessarily be so bad, except the one source he's using to get all this data from is the Commonwealth Fund. The Commonwealth Fund is an organization with a very big left-wing bias, and they've been very outspokenly pro-UHC. So the fact that not only is he getting all of his data from one source, but the one source he chose to get all his data from happens to be one that's very likely to agree with him, that definitely does raise some eyebrows to say the least. Also worth pointing out is that this Commonwealth Fund study that he cites only covers the year 2016. Looking at data from just one year hardly seems sufficient enough to establish any long-term trends. In an article written for the Fraser Institute by Bacchus Brara entitled Waiting Your Turn, we see this article discuss the results of a study conducted by the Fraser Institute to analyze healthcare wait times in Canada. One thing that's worth noting is how comprehensive the study is. Not only does the study cover data from provinces all over Canada, but it also does so over a two-decade-long time period, giving year-by-year -year comparisons along the way. This Fraser Report study does a much better job of establishing long-term trends than does the Commonwealth Fund study that Anton cites, which only cites one year of data, and doesn't even bother establishing any year-by-year -year trends. Establishing long-term trends in data is important because it gives you a more holistic way to interpret the long-term effects of various healthcare policies, something you would obviously miss out on if you're only looking at data from one year. Now that we've looked at wait time data in several different areas, let's see if we can draw some sort of a general conclusion about how certain countries or healthcare systems perform. The United States has the shortest wait times in two of the four areas, specialist visits and elective surgery. In the other two areas, however, ER visits and regular doctor visits, the United States is outperformed by mixed systems. In the two areas where the United States does best, France, Germany, and the Netherlands, with their mixed systems, don't trail too far behind. The general conclusion we can reach about the United States is that it's not quite as exceptional as right-wingers would lead you to believe. In two areas, it does best, and in the other two areas, it does average. So we can say that the United States is above average in this area. That is to say, it has below average wait times. How do the public healthcare systems perform? In all four cases, public systems on average were outperformed by the United States. In two cases, specialist visits and elective surgery, they were outperformed significantly, and in the other two cases, ER and doctor visits, they were only slightly outperformed. Finally, the mixed systems on average had shorter wait times than the United States in two areas, doctor and ER visits, and longer wait times than the US in the other two areas, non-emergency surgery and specialist visits. And in all four cases, the mixed systems had shorter wait times than the public systems. To summarize the general conclusions even more briefly, the United States and mixed systems have similar wait times, and public systems have the longest wait times. I can admire that this guy takes an honest approach to looking at the data, and I definitely give him credit for admitting that more market-oriented healthcare systems have lower than average wait times when compared to publicly run healthcare systems because this is something that a lot of UHC proponents like to dance around and kind of pretend doesn't exist, while Anton straight up accepts and admits it. And while to an extent I can give this guy points for being intellectually honest, he also makes a lot of bad arguments here. One big thing that I took issue with pretty much right off the bat is how this guy portrays counter-arguments against his position. He seems to be cherry-picking low-hanging fruit, like from Steven Crowder in The Daily Wire, and portraying this as if it somehow represents the entirety of the criticism being made against UHC. To see an example of this guy misrepresenting the opposing arguments, let's take a look at this point he makes toward the beginning of the video. A big problem I have with the approach many conservatives take is that they'll look at a specific example like this and assume that this is the norm in more progressive healthcare systems. <laughs> The way he's portraying the opposition here makes it seem as if we're cherry-picking data from Canada and extrapolating that to other UHC countries. And that might very well be what Steven Crowder is doing, but it's certainly not what everyone who opposes UHC is doing. Instead, more often than not, what people do is they look at data from one UHC country, Canada for example, and then compare that with data from other UHC countries and try to see if there's any common patterns. Nobody's making the argument that every single UHC country is a point-for-point 
mirror of the Canadian system. Of course you're going to see different data when you look at different countries, but there's also patterns that you can use to draw a common thread among the systems. Saying that there's a pattern in the data that links these systems together is a lot different from arguing that they're all the same system. We see another example of this guy misrepresenting arguments made by the opposition here. Something you'll notice when you read conservative writing on this question, aside from, wow, this is trash, is that they will present you with a statistic on wait times in a certain country, but they often won't compare it to anything. They simply throw out a statistic in isolation and say, oh my goodness, how terrifying, without even showing us that it's dramatically worse than the system we have in the United States, and without demonstrating that this is the norm under public healthcare system. You are a retard! It's too much to take! Much to take. You're full of shit! <laughs> Now, it would be one thing if he was criticizing a specific article for doing this, but he's making it out as if this is a common problem among all criticisms against UHC. He's trying to make it out as if people who criticize UHC never compare UHC to the American system. And this is provably false. We see direct comparisons being made between the US and Canadian healthcare systems in this article here, written by Sally Pipes for Investor.com. In this article, Miss Pipes makes several direct comparisons between the American and Canadian healthcare systems systems. For example, Pipes points out that Canadian patients can expect to wait on average two times longer for non-emergency treatments and four times as long for emergency treatments than their American counterparts. And keep in mind, this is just one article. I could gather a lot more arguments against UHC that make comparisons with the American system, but if I did, we'd be here all night, so I'm just going to go ahead and move on. In addition to misrepresenting opposing arguments, another thing this guy does is make claims without backing them up with any evidence. Here's an example of that right here. It's important to point out that they're talking about surgeries for non-life-threatening conditions here. If you need emergency surgery in the UK, let's say you get wheeled in on a stretcher with 15 stab wounds and you're on the brink of death. They're not going to be like, all right, let's add him to the bottom of the list. See you a hundred days from now, asshole. Assuming you haven't died by then. <laughs> no, if it's an emergency, you're going to get treated right away. And the surgeries are clearly getting prioritized based upon the urgency and importance of the surgery. This is a very common left-wing talking point. Sure, maybe UHC countries have longer than average wait times, but those wait times are prioritized based on urgency of care. Supporters of UHC make this argument all the time, but they never back it up with any data or facts. As a matter of fact, when we actually look at the data, what we see is that it's not that uncommon for elective procedures to be given priority over emergency treatments in the NHS. So in spite of what UHC proponents might claim, there's simply no guarantee that your treatment is going to be prioritized based on urgency. And I've got news for you conservatives. The same thing happens in the United States. Let's look again at the Commonwealth Fund study. In the United States, 4% of patients waited 4 months or longer for non-emergency or elective surgery, whereas 32% waited between 1 and 4 months. I like how this is supposed to be some kind of big gotcha. Like, oh yeah? Well, this same problem still exists in the American system too. Like, yeah, we know it does. The American healthcare system has plenty of problems. It's a shitty statist corporatist system, just like the shitty statist corporatist system you advocate for. The only difference is that since the US is slightly more market-oriented, these problems are less significant. I'm going to say this multiple times throughout the video because it bears repeating. The U.S. is not a free market healthcare system. It's not even close. So while he frames these wait times in the U.K. as an outrageous scandal, when you compare the U.K. against the U.S., all we're really talking about here is a minor difference of 8%. Bruh, that's freaking quadruple what the American system is. Yeah, I'm sure an 8% difference might not seem like that big of a difference at first, but when you consider that these healthcare systems treat millions of people every year, that 8% could actually make a pretty big difference. This is another big problem I have with the way he frames the whole wait time issue. While I definitely do give him credit for being intellectually honest and admitting that, yeah, the facts show that government-run healthcare systems do have 
have higher on average wait times. I also can't help but to feel like he's trivializing the issue. Like these longer wait times are really no big deal and they're something that we can just brush to the side and ignore. These wait times aren't just abstract numbers. These wait times represent real life human beings who are suffering because their medical treatments are being needlessly delayed. A majority of people who wind up on these waiting lists are basically doomed from the start as their treatments will either never come or get delayed to the point that their illness is no longer treatable. Wait times in a healthcare system pose significant problems, especially when it comes to certain types of conditions that need to be treated right away. And we see this reflected in the data. The UK has abysmally low cancer survival rates. The US healthcare system has a lot of problems, but there is one area where it generally excels, and that is in cancer treatment. Not only does the US have some of the highest cancer survival rates in the world, but the US is also a world leader in researching cancer or treatments. So at this point in the video, Anton starts making some arguments about privatization. Sure, maybe countries with socialized medicine have higher than average wait times. But is privatization necessarily the answer? This is the issue we'll be exploring in this part of the video. However, two countries with mixed systems do perform just as well as the United States does. So this seems to indicate that a private healthcare system is not necessary for short specialist wait times. Well, of course the United States is going to perform just as well as mixed systems systems because the United States is a mixed system. The United States has a high level of government involvement in our healthcare system, probably just as much as a lot of these other countries he's citing. And the general trend of the data still shows that countries with more privatized healthcare systems have shorter waiting times. Like yeah, I'm sure you can find some counterexamples. I'm sure there are some examples out there of countries with more heavy government involvement in healthcare that might perform better in certain areas. But these are exceptions. The general trend is still more government equals more wait times. And even in instances where a government-run healthcare system might perform better in certain areas, is that necessarily because there's more government involvement? Couldn't there possibly be other factors at play as well? In a way, Bandler sort of answers his own question in his article. In one section, he describes the exorbitant wait times in the UK, and in another, he points out that, quote, the NHS is facing staff shortages, end quote. Couldn't that be partially responsible for the long wait times? If there are fewer doctors available to see patients, clearly there's going to be a longer waiting line formed behind each one of them. A question you should be asking yourself at this point is why exactly is it that the NHS is facing this issue of doctor shortages? More specifically, a better question to ask would be, why is it that the NHS in particular is facing these shortages while this is much less of an issue in other more privatized healthcare systems? This goes back to that point I made at the beginning of the video. Because the NHS is a socialized system, because it's funded through coercion, the people running the NHS basically have no incentive to meet people's demands in a prompt manner. Oh, and FYI, it's not just doctors that the NHS is short on. The NHS is actually short on a lot of different medical equipment, including hospital beds. Bed shortages have become such a problem at some UK hospitals that they actually started intentionally killing patients to free up bed space. And not that I'm opposed to private supplementary care, but I don't see why such a problem couldn't be dealt with within a public system. If staff shortages are a problem and higher pay would reduce the problem, why not just increase pay within the public system? So this is a very common left-wing argument. Whenever there's a government program that's failing horribly, just throw a bunch of money at it and there, that'll fix the problem. And well, yeah, it's true that if these government-run healthcare programs have more money, they can hire more doctors. But that's not the end of the conversation. There's several questions that you have to answer here. For example, how many more doctors do we hire? If you don't hire enough doctors, then you're stuck with the same shortage shortage problems you had before. If you hire too many doctors, well now you're wasting money on idle resources. And then there's also the issue of what kind of doctors do you want to hire. Most doctors specialize in a particular field of medicine, whether it be cardiology, dentistry, physical therapy, etc. And there's going to be different demand for different types of medical services. You don't, for example, want to hire a bunch of chiropractors when the primary demand is for heart surgery. Any new doctors you hire are also going to need equipment to work with. You can have all the doctors
workers in the world. If they don't have the stethoscopes, x-rays, and various tools they need to do their job, well, they're going to be pretty much useless. Now, the free market has supply and demand mechanisms in place to deal with all of these issues. Trying to balance expenses and resources with demand becomes a lot more challenging when you try to do it through central planning as opposed to through a free market. To demonstrate why throwing more money at a healthcare system doesn't necessarily make it better, I'd like to refer everyone to this article here entitled Sweden's Healthcare is a Total Embarrassment. The Swedish healthcare system actually has more money and doctors than most other countries in Europe, and yet Sweden consistently has some of the lowest rated healthcare in Europe. Meanwhile, poorer European countries with less healthcare funding actually have better quality health care with shorter wait times. You might say, aha, but that means taxes are going to have to go up. And if doctors are making more money under both systems, at the end of the day, you're going to pay for it either through your tax dollars or through your out-of-pocket spending. Even if we assume that the increase in per-person health care costs would be the same under both a public and private system, you would still very likely end up paying a lot more if that were to be funded through taxation, because taxation increases the number of middlemen and bureaucratic machinery involved in the situation. Instead of just, you know, paying for the health care directly, now it has to go through the IRS and the Treasury Department and whatever other department it goes through. The other really big issue with taxation is that because it's a coercive system, you basically lose any sort of freedom of choice you would have as a consumer. In a free market healthcare system, you get to decide what insurance policy you want, how much coverage you want, how much you're willing to pay. In a coercive government-run system, you lose the freedom to make any of those choices. The government makes it for you. And if you don't like whatever healthcare provider the government is paying for, if you think you could get a better deal under a different arrangement, well, too bad you're forced to pay for it. So at this point in the video, Anton begins responding to a video from PragerU criticizing the VA healthcare system. And as before, he misrepresents the arguments that are being made. 18% waiting longer than 30 days is a fairly large percentage, and obviously we'd like that number to be lower. But based upon Pete's presentation, I would have expected it to be much worse. We're told in this video that the average wait time in Phoenix was 115 days. Pete then says, quote, Phoenix turned out to be the norm, not the exception, end quote. Clearly, Phoenix was not the norm if only 18% of veterans waited longer than 30 days, never mind what percentage waited 115 days. So Anton is misrepresenting the argument that's being made here. The way that Anton is portraying the argument makes it seem as if the PragerU video is cherry-picking data from Phoenix and then extrapolating that to the entire VA healthcare system. The PragerU video doesn't just use data from Phoenix, however. They actually look at several VA locations across the United States. Now, general performance data for the VA system as a whole is somewhat difficult to come by. And a big reason for that is because the VA doesn't have any formal system in place for keeping track of wait times. It's very common for veterans to end up completely in the dark as to how long they can expect to wait for their medical services. Perhaps he meant Phoenix was the norm in the sense that data falsification was pervasive, but the way he presents this one statistic and then says it's the norm could very easily give the misimpression that wait times of this duration are standard across the VA. Even if it's the case that PragerU was just cherry-picking data from Phoenix, isn't it still a huge problem that data falsification is so prevalent in the VA system? Isn't the fact that wait times and quality of care is so bad in the VA that they have to lie still a problem? Isn't the fact that half the time they don't even know what their wait times even are a huge fucking problem? They had this many backlogs despite them receiving a $1 million grant to address them. He apparently expects us to drop our jaws and pledge our allegiance to the free market at this point. But when we're talking about healthcare, $1 million really isn't that much. There are individual doctors who make half that amount in a single year. Let's assume that the average doctor is getting paid $200,000 per year. Doctors watching this video are like, pfft, only 200000 Fucking losers. And then they speed away in their Maserati while holding up a middle finger. That's what doctors are like in real life, right? 
$200,000 per doctor amounts to an additional 5 doctors on staff, and assuming it's a hospital with 100 doctors, a roughly 5% staffing increase very well may not be enough to handle the backlog of patients. Couldn't this still be considered an argument in favor of privatization, though? If the government wasn't willing or able to give them the sufficient funds that they needed to adequately address the issue, isn't that a form of mismanagement on the government's part? If a person was truly interested in getting a general idea of how the VA functions, they wouldn't play this little game that conservatives play, where they look exclusively at the single worst examples of performance they can find. They would ask, what conclusions can be reached from an examination of the data overall? Well, that's all fine and dandy, but uh, you never really bother looking at the data overall. You would think at this point Anton would start looking at sources of data for wait times in the VA system as a whole, but but he never really does that. As a matter of fact, he just kind of abandons the issue of wait times altogether and moves on to a completely different topic. According to a 2015 Gallup poll, 78% of veterans, or those in the military, are, quote, satisfied with the way the health system is working, end quote. Red herring! So this is an example of what's known as the red herring fallacy. It's basically when you switch topics mid-conversation to try and distract from the issue at hand. The conversation was initially about wait times in the VA system, but then Anton brings up data about satisfaction rates. The problem, though, is that the conversation at hand has nothing to do with satisfaction rates. It's about wait times. So it's kind of pointless for Anton to bring up this data when it has nothing to do with the conversation at hand. By comparison, 77% on Medicare are satisfied, as are 75% on Medicaid. If these single-payer programs in this country truly were so disastrous, why would we see satisfaction rates this high? And why are people on these single-payer programs more satisfied than people who receive insurance either from their employer, 69% of whom are satisfied, or people whose insurance is paid for by themselves or a family member, 65% of whom are satisfied? If privatization is the answer, then why does the polling data indicate that privatization is not the answer? I like how he equates our statist corporatist insurance system with privatization. Like, yeah, of course I would expect to see low approval ratings for insurance in the United States. Like, yeah, insurance in this country is pretty awful, but that's not because of privatization. Actually, it's pretty much the opposite. The government prohibits people from purchasing insurance from companies out of state, limiting their options. The government also forces people to pay for coverage they don't need, making health insurance artificially expensive. A lot of people on the left love to bitch about how health insurance tends to be tied to employment in this country, but guess who mandates that? The government. So yeah, I have a strong hunch that the massive dissatisfaction towards American health care isn't due to privatization. Another thing worth pointing out is that private insurance isn't trailing that far behind, less than 10% on average. If government-run health care systems really were just wiping the floor with the private system, you would expect to see a much greater discrepancy. One final thing I want to point out here is that the only thing this data proves is that the single-payer model on average has higher levels of satisfaction. It doesn't necessarily prove that privatization is not the answer. In the description of this video, I posted some links to some information about what's known as lodge practice. Basically, there were these organizations that people would join. They would all chip in this money toward this organization, and then the organization would negotiate with healthcare providers providers to get health care provided to its members. Basically, it was a privatized voluntary system that operated on the single-payer model, and it actually functioned pretty well. The average working class person could afford an entire year worth of health care on one day worth of salary. So if you like the single-payer model, there's ways of doing it without government. By the way, 41% of the uninsured are satisfied with our healthcare system. Why is that number not 0%? Because free market innovation makes the cost of healthcare services cheaper. So while being uninsured might not be an ideal circumstance, the healthcare is at the very least affordable enough that you can squeeze by in an emergency. This brings up another point worth noting. Believe it or not, health insurance as a necessity is only a recent phenomenon. Throughout most of American history, health insurance was affordable enough that most people could pay out of 
of pocket. It's only as of the 1960s when healthcare costs started skyrocketing that healthcare went from being an optional luxury to a necessity. And recall that the VA was Pete's chosen example of a shitty single-payer system, yet the data reveals that it's outperforming the private system. When the best example you can think of to make your case actually undermines your case, that is nothing short of embarrassing. Except the data doesn't undermine his case. He was making arguments about wait times in the VA, and then you respond by mentioning satisfaction rates, which is a totally different metric. And if the VA is willing to fudge their data about wait times, then who's to say they're not also willing to fudge their data about satisfaction rates? The takeaway conclusion here is unescapable. The people in countries with either public or mixed systems are significantly more satisfied with their healthcare than we are here in the United States. If wait times and rationing were truly the grueling problems that conservatives make them out to be, why would we see satisfaction rates like this? So this is supposed to be his big gotcha argument. Like, yeah, sure, maybe UHC countries have longer than average wait times, but the polling data also shows that people are also happier with these systems. Ha! Get wrecked, free market healthcare advocates. Mm -hmm. Well, this really isn't the big gotcha point that he thinks it is. It turns out there's actually a lot of problems with using using polling data in your arguments. You see, polling data is ultimately based on subjective opinion, meaning that it can be subject to a lot of various biases. People are ultimately subject to various biases, whether they be political, cultural, social, whatever, that may very well influence them to respond to these polls in ways that may not accurately reflect the actual performance of the system. Do you really think that a die-hard, hardcore liberal is ever going to admit that they're dissatisfied with the UHC healthcare system? Probably not. A lot of it also comes down to what sample of the population your survey includes. Yes, a lot of UHC countries show high satisfaction rates, but a big reason for that is that oftentimes the survey samples exclude people who frequently use their healthcare systems. Thus, dissatisfaction with these healthcare systems often gets massively underreported. The fact that Anton has to rely heavily on data that's ultimately subjective to make his point, I think really shows how little substance there is to his argument. And here's one final thing I want to ask. Because these high satisfaction rates are a very common argument in favor of UHC. If people are just so much happier with these systems than they are with private insurance, then why exactly does it have to be forced onto people? You see, most UHC advocates want people to be forced to pay into and participate in these systems. They don't think you should have a choice. By arguing that these systems have higher satisfaction rates overall, they inadvertently end up shooting their own argument in the foot, because then it would mean that people would voluntarily opt into these systems and we wouldn't need to use coercion. The the fact that many UHC advocates continue to insist on using coercion to force these programs on the people is a huge indication that they probably don't believe that these healthcare systems would be quite as popular as they make it out to be. If these systems really are superior in quality and satisfaction and all that stuff, why do you insist on it being forced onto me? That's what I want to know. While it made the most sense to me to classify Switzerland's system as private, it is a heavily regulated private system. As Wikipedia describes, insurers in Switzerland are not allowed to make a profit off of the baseline insurance that's legally required for all Swiss citizens. They can only profit off of supplemental plans. Good luck convincing a majority of conservatives that a. purchasing health insurance should be a legal requirement, and b. that health insurance companies should be legally prohibited from profiting off of their main service. So this is where that problem I mentioned at the beginning of the video rears its ugly head. Anton doesn't bother providing a clear explanation for how he chooses to classify different healthcare systems. And because pretty much all the arguments he makes in this video rests upon the distinction between different healthcare systems, that ends up creating a lot of confusion as well as significantly weakening his arguments. If the Swiss healthcare system isn't a free market, then why label it as a free market? One big problem that I have with a lot of left-wing arguments is that they assume that anything involving private businesses is automatically capitalism. To me, this Swiss system is no different from socialism. If the government forces people to buy something whether or not they want it, how is that any different from taxing them to pay for it? If the government is forcing me to spend my hard-earned money a particular way, 
restricting how I'm allowed to use my own property or what kind of voluntary agreements I can enter into in the market, then they're still usurping my private property rights and my freedom to make decisions as an individual. It's still socialism. The fact that they happen to be using private businesses as middlemen doesn't magically make it capitalism. The laws and corporate constraints that allow the Swiss system to excel would be seen as utterly unacceptable to conservatives in America. So notice how he just assumes that the Swiss system performs better because of these regulations. He never explains exactly how it is that these regulations contribute to the success of the Swiss system, however. If your argument is that the Swiss system performs better because of these regulations, that's something you're going to have to explain. Because it's not immediately clear to me that forcing people to buy insurance or or restricting the amount of profit that insurance companies are allowed to make would improve a country's healthcare system. In fact, anyone who understands economics could probably draw the opposite conclusion. Forcing people to buy something whether they want it or not creates a lot of artificial demand, which raises prices. For all we know, the Swiss are paying way more for their health insurance than they should be. Similarly, restricting the amount of profit that a business can make shifts the supply curve to the left. When you cap the amount of profit that a business can make providing any particular service, then they're incentivized to provide much less of that service. This means that Swiss insurance companies might be offering less comprehensive coverage than they would otherwise. Without an explanation of how specifically these regulations improve the Swiss system, we have no economic reason to believe these regulations actually do anything to help. It's very much a possibility that the Swiss system is successful in spite of, as opposed to because of, these regulations. The United States does have aspects of its healthcare system where the government plays a heavy role, namely Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA. However, when you compare the predominant private segment of the United States system against that of Switzerland, what you find is that within our system, there's a much greater degree of privatization, with companies having a much freer hand and being much less restricted by regulation. So while you might look at the data and suspect that perhaps less regulation is the answer, the Swiss system actually indicates that more regulation would improve our system. The right-wing fantasy is one of unregulated capitalism. The Swiss reality features heavily regulated competition. So first of all, the United States has a lot of the same regulations that the Swiss system does. A lot of states do mandate that people carry a certain minimum amount of health care coverage. And regulations on both the federal and state level often do restrict how much profit insurance companies are allowed to make. On top of that, the regulations in Switzerland only cover insurance, not the actual provision of health care. So these regulations can't be an explanation for why Switzerland has low wait times at their hospitals, since these regulations only say what insurance companies have to do and don't even cover hospitals. Now, as for the United States, well, when you look at a timeline of American healthcare costs, you'll notice that it peaks in the 1960s, and that's right around the same time that the United States saw a massive expansion of government into healthcare. In addition to the passage of Medicaid and Medicare, we also saw massive expansions of FDA restrictions on the pharmaceutical industry, a massive increase increase in licensing requirements for doctors, and a passage of a whole lot of medical regulations that don't even make any sense. For example, if you want to open a new hospital in an area, you actually need permission from other competing hospitals in the area. Imagine if any time you wanted to open a new business, you need permission from all the other competing businesses in the area. Well, yeah, of course there's going to be shortages. Medicaid and Medicare also introduced a lot of additional paperwork that doctors have to do, and now thanks to these systems, doctors spend more time filling out paperwork than they do actually treating patients. So yeah, it's not exactly clear that the Swiss system owes their success to regulations, or that more regulations would improve the US healthcare system. For those who extol the virtues of socialized medicine, and protest that it could never, never, ever lead to rationing, here's a wake-up call from Great Britain. The Telegraph reported, quote, Under the latest restrictions, obese patients in the catchment area who have a BMI of 30 or more will be barred from routine surgery for non-life-threatening conditions for a year, although they may secure a referral sooner if they shed 10% of their weight, end quote. Smokers' operations will be postponed for six months, but they can get on surgeons' waiting lists earlier if they offer evidence they have stopped smoking for at least eight weeks, end quote. 
I have to say, of all the potential examples of rationing in healthcare, this is the one that he points to to express his indignation. So you may have noticed sort of a pattern throughout this video. Anton is basically taking certain low-hanging fruit arguments that he feels is easy to criticize and trying to represent that as the entirety of the criticism from the right. This is like the fourth time he's done it in this video. What Anton is doing here is cherry-picking a particularly benign instance of rationing and acting like this is the entirety of it. Like, yeah, that's not the worst form of rationing that happens in the NHS. NHS rationing actually gets worse. It gets a lot worse. For an example of how truly egregious rationing can get in the NHS, the NHS has a well-established death pathway. If you're elderly, or if you're generally just deemed too big of a pain in the ass to treat, then you can get denied treatment, or even denied food and water. That's right, the NHS intentionally starves people to death to free up bed space. You know, food, water, beds, things you would just kind of expect there to be at any hospital in a first world country, are considered luxuries in the NHS. Keep in mind that this is only a routine surgery for non-life-threatening conditions that these fatties and smokers are banned from. So it's not like they're being denied essential care to save their lives. It's not like an obese person in the UK gets wheeled into the ER needing emergency heart surgery, and the doctors are like, ha ha, too bad for you, you fat bum. Again, he makes this claim without backing it up with any data. The NHS puts out a statement that says, oh, if it's an emergency, we'll prioritize you and we're not going to ration your health care. But we've seen in data previously presented in this video that the NHS has a very poor track record of managing resources and prioritizing cases based on urgency. So while I'm sure it's the NHS's official policy that if it's an emergency we're not supposed to ration your health care, I highly doubt that's what actually happens in reality. On top of that, at least these people can nullify this policy by simply kicking the idiotic habit of smoking, or improving their health and physical appearance by losing weight. So one very important thing to point out here is that this NHS policy is based on body mass index as opposed to body fat content. What that basically means is that this policy targets anyone with a higher than average weight, not just people who are obese. This means that people who happen to have thicker muscles or denser bones might tip the scale slightly higher and therefore be placed on this restriction, even though it's totally beyond their control. And let's get real here, the NHS isn't forcing you to smoke a pack a day. This is ultimately your decision. Yes, genetics and environment play a role, and it's harder for some people than others, but at the end of the day, smokers can kick the habit, and fat people can lose the weight. Is this really the kind of world you want to live in, though? A world where the government can withhold health care from you to coax you into living a particular lifestyle? That seems pretty draconian to me. Like, yes, yeah, smoking does increase risks to your personal health, but some people enjoy smoking, and if they're willing to accept those additional risks to their health to do something they enjoy, why shouldn't they be free to make that decision? This brings up another very important point you have to consider about universal health care. When you collectivize health care costs, you also collectivize health care responsibility. In a system where everyone's responsible for their own health care, if a person decides to eat poorly or abuse drugs or whatever, they're ultimately only impacting themselves since they're the only ones who have to pay for that. In a system where everybody's forced to pay for everyone else's health care, well now it's no longer just that person's responsibility because now they're no longer the only person shouldering the costs. This is why in UHC countries you tend to see a lot of state paternalism. Laws that restrict the amount of fat and sugar that can be in food. This is because when the state pays for your health care, the state suddenly has an interest in what kind of lifestyle you get to live. The left tends to have a massive boner for laws that force people to wear seatbelts and motorcycle helmets. And a very common argument they use to justify this is the burden that you put on the public health care system. A world where the government pays for your health care but then gets to dictate what kind of lifestyle you get to live seems like a Faustian bargain. I'd much rather pay for my own health care and just be responsible for my own lifestyle choices. All we really mean when we talk about rationing and health care is deciding upon how to best allocate limited resources in high demand. This process of rationing, while perhaps undesirable, is an inevitable part of health care, and it's also not something that private health care systems are immune from. Yes, that's right, I've got news for you people. This doesn't just happen in countries with public health care systems. Rationing takes place in the United States as well. He says rationing takes place in the U.S. health care system as if that's something that's new to us. Like, yeah, we know that rationing also takes place in the U.S. health care system. The resources to provide health care are limited, yes. So obviously you're going to need some kind of system in place to allocate those scarce resources. 
But why exactly is it that a centrally planned system with no incentive to economize would do a better job at allocating those resources than a free market-based system where companies have an incentive to provide a high quality at a low cost? Another problem here is that Anton is arguing as if the amount of resources that any healthcare system has to work with at any given time are always fixed and permanent and can never change. And that might be the case with a government-run system that operates with a fixed budget, but a free market healthcare system wouldn't have this limitation. In a free market, resources would be more free to move where they're needed. A woman in Britain was forced to pull out her own teeth because she couldn't get a dentist appointment, and Prime Minister Tony Blair told her, well, sorry, you're shit out of luck, I can't just make more dentists. And yeah, I'm sure that your centralized government planned system can't just conjure up more dentists out of the ether, but in a free market, if there's more demand for dentists, and therefore there's more of a profit to be made from being a dentist, well then you're going to incentivize more people to become dentists to meet that demand. The free market has brought down the cost and made more available all kinds of things. Computers, cars, sports equipment. There's no reason it can't do this for healthcare. Commonwealth Fund reports that 19% of Americans just in the past 12 months skipped a medical test, treatment, or follow-up recommended by a doctor specifically because of the cost. Compare this to the average of 4% who responded this way in public systems and the 8% who responded this way in mixed systems. This is a bit of a disingenuous comparison because you're only comparing people who sought out treatment and not people who've actually received treatment. Like, yeah, sure, maybe people are more likely to seek out treatment in UHC countries, but that doesn't mean anything if the healthcare is not available when you need it. Yes, American healthcare is way too expensive and way too many people every year die or go bankrupt because of our high medical costs. But forcing people to wait months or even years on a waiting list hardly seems like a solution to me. They also report that in the past 12 months, 18% of Americans either didn't collect prescription medication or skipped doses, purely because of the cost. And that is no surprise, because prescription drugs in this country are extremely expensive. Well, yeah, I'm not shocked that drugs are expensive in the United States. The FDA makes it extremely expensive and difficult to publish new drugs in this country. Thousands of people die every year because a drug that could have potentially saved their life was stuck behind FDA red tape. You leftists whine up and down a blue streak about how expensive drugs are in this country, but then you support things like the FDA, which is largely responsible for making drugs more expensive. We also do ridiculous shit in America, like arrest people for possessing marijuana, even when it's prescribed by a doctor. It's also not clear that more government involvement in the pharmaceutical industry will bring the cost of drugs down. Let's take a look at some data from Canada, a country where the pharmaceutical industry is heavily controlled by the government. In Canada, everything from antibiotics to aspirin costs twice as much as it does in the U.S. The government artificially lowers the price of name brand drugs, but that means the price of generics has to go up to compensate. And probably the most outrageous, Canadian pharmacies have to charge an additional dispensing fee to compensate for the cost of drugs. And this dispensing fee can easily wind up being twice as much as what you paid for the actual drugs. There's also a very important point that needs to be made and understood here. So take your little pecker out of your hand and pay attention. The financial barriers to our healthcare system almost certainly reduce the wait times in our country. Think about it. 12% of U.S. adults lack health insurance, and 19% regularly skip recommended treatments or visits for financial reasons. This doesn't even factor in the many people who, just as a general rule to save money, avoid doctor visits for everything except the most serious or urgent of conditions. People who otherwise would be in the healthcare system stay out of it purely because of its exorbitant cost in the United States. And that means that wait times are going to be shorter because there's a smaller percentage of people trying to access the country's healthcare system at any given time. So the very wait times that conservatives point to as proof of the exceptional quality of our healthcare system are actually partly the product of its extreme dysfunction. So he's trying to argue as if the lower wait times in the U.S. are because less people are accessing our healthcare system because less people can afford it. And while I'm sure that might be a contributing factor, that in isolation couldn't account for the vast discrepancies that we see between these systems. The reason, to a very large extent, that we have shorter wait times in the U.S. is because we have a comparative 
relatively more marketized system. So there's a relatively greater degree to which market signals are able to operate. Also, less people seeing the doctor because of cost isn't necessarily a bad thing. Think about it for a minute. If seeing a doctor is free, then you're going to go see the doctor every single time you get a minor cold or stub your toe or anything like that. And of course, that's going to bog down time and resources they could be using to treat more serious issues. And yeah, you know what? I'm all in favor of making healthcare more affordable and more accessible. But being able to access the healthcare system doesn't mean shit if that healthcare system can't provide you the treatment you need when you need it. So despite what right-wingers will argue when they only shine a spotlight on one poorly performing country, this narrow area of access to MRI or CT machines can't be used to discredit single-payer systems or systems with heavy government involvement. By the way, this strikes me as a somewhat strange argument. Canada's healthcare sucks because of their per capita access rates to MRI machines. It's such a narrowly specific critique of their healthcare system. I don't know about you, but MRI units per million people probably doesn't even make my top 30 list of healthcare priorities. It's not just MRI machines that UHC countries tend to have shortages of. They have shortages of all different types of medical equipment, including ambulances. Here's a problem that's virtually non-existent in the U.S. healthcare system. In Sweden, it's extremely difficult to get an ambulance to your house. In America, if you need an ambulance, you call 911, say you need an ambulance, and an ambulance is on its way. Simple as that. Not quite that simple in Sweden. In Sweden, when you call 911, you basically have to beg for an ambulance. And the dispatcher basically decides whether or not you need an ambulance without actually being at the scene or assessing anyone's injuries. And if they decide you don't need an ambulance, well, then you're basically shit out of luck. You better hope there's a friend or family member nearby who can drive your ass to the hospital or else you're screwed. And this isn't an isolated issue, by the way. I have like six different articles that cover the piss-poor ambulance availability in Sweden. In Sweden, it's easier to get the pizza delivery guy to your house than a fucking ambulance. And this issue isn't isolated to Sweden either. The same thing happened in the UK. A man called 911 because he was having a heart attack. The ambulance showed up five hours later. The guy was long dead by the time they got there. The excuse they gave was that he was on a waiting list, because of course he fucking was. So medical equipment shortage is a huge problem in UHC countries, but who says that the free market can't fix it? Take a look at the flip Defibrillators. A defibrillator is a machine used to treat heart attacks by sending an electrical pulse through the cardiac muscles. When they were first invented, they were very large, bulky, difficult to operate. Well, now fast forward about 40 years, we now have defibrillators that are cheap, portable, and easy to use. Now with a very minimal amount of training, any EMT or nurse could use a defibrillator. And thousands of lives are saved every year thanks to the free market making this medical device more cheap and accessible. God damn, that was a good video, if I might say so myself. Agree to disagree. While to an extent I can give Anton credit for being intellectually honest and admitting that yeah, UHC countries have higher on average wait times, there are still a lot of fundamental problems with this video. My biggest problem with this video is that he tends to cherry pick specific easy to debunk criticisms being made against UHC and act like this is the entirety of the criticism being made against it. In addition to that, he also downplays the seriousness of longer wait times in the medical system. He makes a lot of claims without backing them up with data, or cherry picks specific data that makes his case look good. Anyways, I plan on destroying this guy's other healthcare videos too. If that's something you want to see, be sure to subscribe. This has been Philosopasa, making stupidity play dead. Until next time, take care.